welcome back to Pop Culture Graveyard. I am Hollis. With me, as always, is Dave. Hello, Dave. Hello, Hollis. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I came up with a good hello, but it's purely visual. It is. We have signaled, much like the characters in today's film, Galaxy Quest, which is what year is it from? Well, while you're looking that up, I want to. I, by now, people have noticed that I rep little books and little figurines and stuffed animals in the background today mm -hmm. today i'm repping this right here, <laughs> right here. Ho hollis will i'm holding up an issue of uh teenage mutant ninja turtles comic yeah. book not yeah. comic book what is it? you tell me hollis it's a children's book it's a chapter oh. book teenage mutant ninja turtles that i wrote a number of years ago i've written many many children's books uh teenage mutant ninja turtles shimmer and shine a lot of paw patrol so you might see written by Hollis James in any number of them if you have little kids. But uh, thanks, thanks, Dave. How did you <laughs> how'd you even end up with that? I, I bought it from eBay. Oh, you son of a! <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm happy I, to be represented. Mikey's monster. It's not yeah. a bad episode either. Yeah, I, I liked it. All right. Well, thank you for having me represented in the the room behind you. We are jumping into another sci-fi movie featuring Sigourney Weaver. Unintentional double feature. Yeah. This one is a sci-fi comedy from 1999. We're going to party like it's 1999 today, Dave, because we're doing Galaxy Quest, directed by Dean Parasat, or Parasot. Screenplay by David Howard and Robert Gordon. Story by David Howard. I don't know any of these guys, but I Me really... Me either. <laughs> but I really, what? really like this film. So... I just want to kick this off by saying we called Breaking Away, Daniel Stern's Breaking Away. I'm going to call this film Alan Rickman's Galaxy Quest. I'll give it to you. Yeah. Dr. Lazarus. Yep. He steals yeah. this. He body slams this movie the same way he did the Harry Potter franchise. The same thing he did in Die Hard. He is mm -hmm. unforgettable in this. He's so good. Yeah. How good is he? He is amazing. It would be great if we didn't like have to make a joke out of it and just talk about it as if we're like, today we're doing Galaxy Quest starring, you know, and yeah. then just, and by the way, co-starring Enrico Calantoni as Mathazar. He is the leader of the, what does Tim Allen um, call them? He, he calls them by the wrong name. Thermians. Thermians. And he calls them termites. Tim Allen calls them termites. <laughs> Which, which is so Tim Allen. Galaxy improvement. <laughs> yeah. So um, uh, Enrico Calantoni is Mathazar, the leader of the Thermians. And honestly, I don't think this movie exists without his portrayal. And then the subsequent falling in line of every other Thermian behind his, how he decided to enact them. So good. Now, correct so me if I'm wrong, wasn't he in like, Just Shoot Me? You know what? He was the best thing about Just Shoot Me. Yeah, he was the photographer. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I used to watch that show, Comfort Food, you know, and I also like the little guy. What's his name? Uh, David Spade. David Spade. He's hilarious on that show. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think you, you don't like the boss, the dad on that oh. show. Yeah, I've always, uh, much to <laughs> everyone I know's chagrin. I have never liked George Siegel. I'm fine with that. I'm not a huge fan. Yeah. He's but, been in a lot of films that I like. And even by like mm -hmm. my one of my favorite directors, Robert Altman. He's been in stuff with Barbara Streisand, Owl and the Pussycat, The Hot Rock with Robert Redford. He was in some classic films. I always have to watch around him. Even The Goldbergs. Yeah, I hear you. I enjoyed the first oh, yeah, couple of seasons right. of The Goldbergs. He was the best thing on it quite frankly. Uh, yeah, that show's not good. But um, all said, he's not my favorite. Enrico Calantoni in Just Shoot Me, occasionally there'd be episodes where something emotional would happen to him and he would shine. Like anytime they asked him to act and not just be this sort of like unbuttoned shirt photographer who gets models, mm -hmm. anytime they asked him to be a person, he was amazing. And I was always like, wow, this guy's actually very good. Well, you know, what's funny is the first few episodes or whenever I got into Just Shoot Me when it was on the air, I remember thinking like, wait a minute, they want us to believe that guy's a ladies man? Like mm -hmm. he yeah. he so did not look the part, mm -hmm. but he must have killed in the audition and got the part, even though he's against type, because 
while I was watching it, after a while, I was like, oh, he's a ladies man. His personality. He's a great guy. He used his acting to convince you that's what they're supposed to do. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, we'll talk about that, too, later in this episode, what acting is and how yeah. not all actors do it. Oh, God, ain't that the truth? It's inescapable, I think, when talking about Galaxy Quest to not look at it as a skewering of the original Star Trek series. It's like a 1980s Star Trek. There are a lot of parallels, right down to Tim Allen being the Shatner-esque leader of this crew of both actors and on screen of space explorers. But also, it's his show. And yet, much like our beloved Leonard Nimoy as Spock, the character of Alan Rickman, Dr. Lazarus, totally overshadows the Tim Allen character. Absolutely. Uh, and is so much more fun. And his head is some odd conglomeration of like purple cabbage and sea crustacean. But within five seconds of Alan Rickman opening his mouth, you buy it and you're like, oh, he's an alien. He immediately stops looking weird. Yep. Almost immediately. Because he carries himself with such grace and like respect. You immediately yeah. accept it. Whereas somebody else, you might think he looks ridiculous through the entire movie. Right. He's wearing the head. Yeah. The head isn't wearing him. Yeah. <laughs> it's a very good correlation between him and Nimoy. It yeah. breaks out into the real world with Tim Allen and Rickman and Shatner and Nimoy. So there are similarities in the actuality outside of the film or the TV as well. I just love how many of the kind of tropes that we now accept as a given, are skewered in this film, right down to the actors who were on this show, this very popular show, which is now a cult item, which draws many people to, you know, quest. Cons. Cons. <laughs> yeah. Very much like the Star Trek conventions. So in 1999, convention goers and cosplayers, it's still a thing to get picked on for. It's still something that hasn't reached a point where it's respected. It's the opposite. It's looked down upon. It's for people who don't have a life. That's all bullshit. And it's actually an incredibly creative and brave thing to do. Mm -hmm. The conventions, especially the science fiction conventions and things like them, are huge collections of good people practicing positivity. This movie was probably the first movie to treat them with respect, realizing that those people are cool and creative and brave and awesome yeah. and interesting and fun mm -hmm. to be around. This movie was probably the first to treat them that way. So okay. I like to see the cosplayers and the convention goers uh, yeah. treated. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, they're the heroes of the film, too. Um, yeah, that's sweet. The actors themselves, you have Alan Rickman's character and like they're waiting to go on and each one of them launches into their kind of party piece when they start to feel f sorry for themselves. Alan Rickman has the best, I think. He's like, I played Richard III. I got five mm -hmm. curtain calls. I was a real actor once. And everyone else is like mouthing no, along. It's, they know it's five. <laughs> they know exactly yeah. what he's going to say. Yeah. And I don't know which is her. Tawny, Galaxy Quest. which is. Uh, yeah, Tawny Madison as Gwen DeMarco. But they're both she has three names, you know, fake like, names. That's the thing about the, talking about this. You need three names now. You almost need four <laughs> with Sigourney Weaver. You need Sigourney Weaver. You need her taunt, her Gwen DeMarco, the actress's name, Tawny Madison. And you kind of need Ripley for when you're talking about her. So that's four <laughs> names. It's a lot. <sighs> um, I'll tell you something. I'm not telling secrets. I am not a big Tim Allen fan. This is easily his best performance in anything, I truly believe. Absolutely. Have you heard the Tim Allen, uh, Alan Rickman story? Oh, God, no. Please tell me. Okay. It's a, it's a pretty good one. Okay. I believe this story was told originally by the director, but I'm not sure. But it's a true story. There's a scene where Tim Allen has to confess to Mathazar, the lead alien, that the historical tapes they thought they were watching are actually pretend, or what the aliens would call lies and deceit. Mm -hmm. And he has to admit to Mathazar that he's not a great leader and that the only reason he was so victorious so many times is because it was fake. And Tim Allen is doing this scene where he has to 
talk to Mapazar, who's been tortured for hours. He does a few takes and he gets deeper and deeper into it. And then he gives a take that the entire room is impressed by, that feels real, where he seems upset. He finishes. Tim Allen says, I don't like the way I feel. Excuse me. And he storms out of the room. And Alan Rickman, I don't know who to, he leans over to someone and says, I think he just experienced acting for the first time. I do not doubt it. Yeah, apparently Rickman had a lot to say about Tim Allen throughout. Oh my which is god! It's so perfect because it's exactly what they were. It's almost like it's a parallel. Like, it's a parallel yeah. to the original Star Trek. It's so good, <laughs> right down to the crew in the beginning being like, "He took another job without us." There's the hatred, but there was hatred in the original Star Trek between Shatner and the crew until Shatner kind of made his peace with the crew, you know, and they all got along in later years. But I think they only got along in later years because the movies were more successful and they all kind of had more camaraderie. But if they had just been these people who regroup every once in a while for conventions and whatnot, I think they still wouldn't care for him. Yeah. Um, One of the lines that has never left me is that William Shatner like it was a headline, I believe. William Shatner will not attend Leonard Nimoy's funeral due to scheduling conflict. I remember that. Yeah. I was I was like, okay. He probably had to be on. at the funeral of another guy that hated him. <laughs> God. <laughs> oh, that's pretty good. If you haven't seen Galaxy Quest, it's just about this group of actors from this show, Galaxy Quest, that was once famous, has now gone into obscurity. They still have a rabid fan base, but that fan base is sometimes ridiculed by other people. All of these people are viewed as if their best days are behind them, and they're viewed that way even by the actors themselves. And so they do a lot of appearances places. And when I was a kid in the 70s and 80s, you could see like the lesser cast from Welcome Back, Cotter, or from Different Strokes, or from these different shows at car shows, at mm -hmm. like ribbon cutting ceremonies. And there's a scene where the cast of Galaxy Quest is opening a electronic superstore or something. Yeah, I think, yeah. And early on in the clip they play at the convention, they play Alan Rickman's character's famous line, which is by Grapthar's Hammer, and then any number of secondary lines. Uh, you will I will avenged. avenge thee. I will, yeah, you know, anything he wants to say. And at the opening of this store, he goes, <laughs> by Grapthaw's hammer, what a savings. And it is the best line reading in the entire mm. movie. And Dave, it's got to be the name of this episode. Oh, my God. Yes, it is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So That's good. And is. they pull in close on his face and just there's levels to the performance. And that's what I think a great actor can convey. They can convey many things at once and not all of them through words. And he conveys to the audience part of the reason we got hooked into doing this is because it was in the contract that I would say by mm, Grapto's Hammer, what a saving. He knew it was coming. You yeah, can see, you all, can see of us all this on his here. face. All of it on his face. You have to be here in full makeup with the headgear glued mm -hmm. onto your head in 89 degree weather in the sun at this opening at 8 a.m. or whatever. You can imagine other oh. backstory stuff too. Like during the show, he sat in a chair and technicians applied that headgear gear right these days he applies it himself oh. having to put it on himself and glue it down yeah. and then put makeup over the and he's good at it not in a zen way the way that no. like gene simmons or paul stanley will sit at the mirror for an hour before no, no, going no. on no, where no, no. like eighty thousand people will shout how much they love them while they play he's got to put that on in the back of a trailer at this superstore or like in a back room and then go out in front of 12 to 15 people. It's got to feel like drawing a dick on your own forehead. <laughs> yeah, that's what it feels like. Yeah, he fell asleep <laughs> first at the sleepover right. <laughs> that is his life. Yeah, he fell asleep and he <laughs> drew a dick on his own head. Yeah, that's what he feels like. That's... Which is why it's so great because, you know, 
that they're establishing that so that mm -hmm. they can fix it. It's the point. Yeah. And it's so well established and it's so beautifully fixed. It's fixed by a death in a movie where you don't expect people to actually die. Right. We can't get further without talking about Tim Allen's character. Mm. He was the captain, Jason. I have a question. Yeah. Why are you looking up that last name? That is a last name that you love and cherish. And are you mad that it was given to Tim Allen? Oh, my God. I had forgotten. I was actually thrilled that there could be one part of his character that I liked. And, <laughs> and it's, it of course, Nesmith. Name. Yeah. After <laughs> Michael Nesmith, my favorite monkey from the monkeys, Captain Nesmith. Captain Jason He's, Nesmith? Or, uh, uh, isn't that his actor oh, Jason name? Is the actor. He plays someone. Played Commander oh, Peter Jason Quincy Nesmith. Taggart. Oh, right. Uh, his name couldn't name. matter less. Uh, you know what? Think about that. Commander what? Peter Quincy Taggart. It sounds like I'm hearing it for the first time. That's how much I care about Tim Allen. It's so true. <laughs> it's so true. You know the coolest part about Tim Allen? Is that he was once a Coke dealer who did time. Mm. Anyway, he plays this captain, Captain Taggart, played by Jason Nesmith, his like actor he's playing in this. And there's one scene that I felt he played really well. And that was in the bathroom of the Galaxy Quest convention, where mm -hmm. he goes in the bathroom. First of all, the scene is way over the top. And I don't believe anyone would go to a convention simply to make fun of people. You got to pay like 30 bucks to get in. Plus, there's always one Klingon who's willing to punch you in the back of the head. Absolutely. You don't stand at a urinal and trash talk these people. Yeah. And when Nesmith went into the bathroom, every urinal was filled with tall, tall Klingon-like Yeah, creatures. costumed gentlemen. Yeah. Yeah, who would really cash that check. But there are two smart Alex in the bathroom <laughs> who are making fun of everyone at the convention. And Nesmith is in the stall. At first, he's like oh, a bunch of idiots. But then they're speaking about the crew, his fellow actors. Did you see his crew? They can't stand him. Oh, it's so obvious they hate him. And he has no idea. Yeah, it's like he's yeah. hit with something. And this is the difference between Jason Nesmith and William Shatner. William Shatner never had that moment. I no. feel. <laughs> he never yeah. had a come to Jesus moment of like, wow, oh, these people really hate me. Maybe I better change. And Tim Allen's character does. And he wears it on his face. When he goes back out and he's signing autographs like by rote and he's just Oh, I gotta them. say he did a great job of that, Wasn't that signing good? and sign and throw with like Tim, I want you to sign these and give them out with the least amount of <laughs> feeling possible. Yeah. And he he has lots of good scenes. He has lots of good scenes. I mean, this is yeah. why it's his greatest achievement. It's true. We gotta give him his due because this yeah. he's better in this than he's ever been. So it gets through to him so much that even the other actors see it. And they're like, he's never lost it in front of people before. But we should say that one of the, the fans he loses it in front of is a very super young Justin Long, who would oh, go on yeah. to have a great career. He is so young in this. And he and like three of his friends are this little cabal of super fans who ask ridiculously intricate questions about the structure and integrity of the ship that they used to fly. But Justin Long and his friends will then be a plot point later. They've established that these guys are really into the minutia of the technology. Yeah. Which which becomes important. So right. much becomes... Did you... I'm interrupting. Did you happen to see the David Mamet quote? On Galaxy Quest? Yes. <laughs> Oh, my God. David Mamet once said there are three perfect movies. <laughs> Don't even finish. Oh, that's yeah. great. No. All right. Yeah. Go ahead. What are they? Yeah. I'm pretty sure it was The Godfather. I was going to say else, The Godfather. Yeah. Godfather, something else, and Galaxy Quest. My God. I know. Oh, that's crazy. I know. Like, <laughs> what? I think of David Mamet as existing in a different artistic universe than galaxy mm. quest yeah. i would never like, put those together outside of a bus stop shelter in the rain you know that is just insane to me yeah i mean i don't know much about mammoth but i picture him beating his kid for bringing home galaxy quest <laughs> yeah well you know what there are some things that i understand about mammoth that maybe i could see in here he's the god of rhetoric he understands inter-office politics mm. uh he understands motivation 
Mm -hmm. uh, all of these things are in the engine of Galaxy Quest, but it's still kind of a reach to to think that he would even know about this film, let alone champion it. it. Is. I yeah. love that. I love that though, because you know, how many times have we heard about like guilty pleasures and this and that? There are no more guilty pleasures. People accept that you can sit down and listen to the Ramones and you can then put on the Bee Gees. So like there's not, it's all about mood. It's all Don't about let your what ego you want. get in the way of saying what you like. It really just elevates Mamet. Yeah, in like, my eyes. I God think of him as a super serious guy who doesn't even mm -hmm. crack a smile, you know? Wow. Okay. I, I yeah, love that. Sorry. I love that detour. Little, no. A little you. derailing. If people haven't hmm. signed up for our sidebars by now, <laughs> we're yeah. we're one long detour. That so, one was even vaguely related. They're often not at all. It was. You're right. It was related. Yeah. But I, I love the way that bathroom scene changes the whole way in which Nesmith frames his life and his success and his celebrity. He was a different guy prior to that. Book smart. Coming out of the stall. Yep. Ch changed. Yep. Absolutely. In Absolutely. this case, it's more coming out of the bathroom change. Well, bathroom, she, yeah. She gets her wake up after the stall thing, but right. it's still using the bathroom stall accident, which is a trope. You know, it's, it's in every sitcom. Right. I accidentally overheard people while I was in the stall. Yeah, that's half um, of every Three's Company episode. Mm -hmm. Changes <clears> the direction <throat> of the movie. And, you know, this, and it's nice that the Shatner character, the Tim Allen, Nesmith gets redemption. Yeah. I mean, you know, they're trying to, they're trying to dole out redemption for everyone. The great part about it is he does what you can picture his character having done over and over the entire course of his career. Somebody makes fun of him because his best days were in Galaxy Quest and he's still playing that captain, much like Gilligan still going to car shows and putting on the hat. Bob Denver mm -hmm. having to be Gilligan into his 70s. Someone made fun of him. He was in a bad mood. He goes home. He empties a bottle of scotch. He wakes up hungover and he does another gig. And that gig usually picks him up because people are blowing smoke up him. Hey, you, you know, mm -hmm. we love you. And the thing that gets him feeling good again and back on track is what it in his mind is a gig, but is actually these aliens who took the show as historical records, the transmissions of which reached them years ago, and they'd modeled their whole way of being on the precepts of the show and the kind of ethics that those characters live by. They Shanghai him into being their captain because they're having this horrible battle with this terrible villain who has Saris. killed Saris, played by one of your guys from Babylon 5, I'm sure. Oh, it's Robin, Robin Sachs. Yep. Oh my God, he plays like, he plays several guys. Mm. Um, this evil villain looks kind of like a reptile, a reptilian humanoid kind of thing. Anthropomorphic lizard? Yeah, Nesmith. yeah. He is pure evil. They get Nesmith in to negotiate with him because he's been so successful in all the other historical records of any negotiations, his, his answer is to fire on him. Give, it a, give him everything we got. Give him everything we got. Yeah. And he fires and he's like, okay, I got, I got a thing in Van Nuys in 30 minutes. <laughs> and so he goes and they're like, but you fired on him? That was the negotiation? He's like, yeah, that should take care of him. So they beam him back down, but they give him a transmitter that is the coolest prop he's ever seen. And they beam him back down. And that's when he realizes when this like jelly, I like the way the beaming was done. This like jelly comes right. all up to his yeah. head. And then he's like sent back down. And he realizes only then that he was on an actual spaceship dealing with an actual villain and all that. When he shows up at that, oh, I almost said car show, that electronic electronic superstore for the yeah. for the signing with the other cast, and they're like late again. Like, why do you even bother to show up? He's jazzed, and he actually wants to include the crew and have them go back with him. I think it's Tony Shalhoub's character, which, by the way, is amazing in this. Fred Kwan. Fred Kwan. I love that he has that name, even if he's not, <laughs> you know, of that yeah. persuasion. He has the line when they've all said get out of here when is he, he ever going to ask us to do another gig like <laughs> yeah he never includes them and then they mm -hmm. all get out and they're like you know all right it's a payday let's do it it's a great way to get all of them up on the ship i love also on tony shalhoub i love how there's really no indicators of the fact that tony shalhoub is stoned through the entire movie <laughs> except he's always looking for munchies except 
he's yeah he's Some trying fruit. to buy snacks or eating yeah. snacks and is unaffected by all things when they are beamed to the ship they are all nearly catatonic shivering mm -hmm. uh drooling just utterly mentally destroyed by the process and shaloub says that was a hell of a thing that was a yeah. hell of a thing unflappable goes, what's up with them right you yeah. get the impression that there might have been a like a little scene of him in the back of a van with a bong mm -hmm. like and they cut it out because uh, you know it's a yeah. kid so we got to get a rating but you're right he just seems stoned through the whole thing and he's so easygoing i just love that because i i aspire to be easygoing and i'm anything but that so i love characters like that i think since we're talking about the beaming up or what they call digitizing we have to talk about sam rockwell who screams after he's digitized and they see the aliens as they truly are because they all transform themselves to look human so as not to you know scare they them neglect, they, in this case they neglect it yeah they look kind of like the the elephant from banana splits snork i think was his name <laughs> okay and yeah. it's just this weird they almost look like candy like an elephant candy with octopus it's like willy wonka arms. octopus yeah mm -hmm. it's like a willy wonka octopus yeah we've now said the words alan rickman Sigourney Weaver, Sam Rockwell, Tony Shalhoub. Holy. I mean. It's a dream it, cast. This movie is bizarre. There is a casting director for this film, I'm sure. And that person who, Hollis just put their name on the bottom of the screen. Mm -hmm. If you're watching on YouTube. <laughs> that person is very good at their job. You know how hard it is to convince someone? To convince that many biggies to come on board with something that on the surface almost looks like you're kidding? Yeah. That's a tough sell, in my opinion. I mean, if you stop and think about it, like when I think about Alan Rickman, I think about a serious actor. But at the same time, when I'm thinking about, you know, the 80s and 90s, he finds a way to get comedy and stuff. Like he's practically playing a clown in Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves. Mm -hmm. He plays mm -hmm. this evil evil sheriff of nottingham or whatever evil 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 pathetic 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 <laughs> yeah there are many laughs he's he provides the bulk of the laughs in that movie mm -hmm. and even in die hard he finds a way to be charming and to be not your typical baddie he he's, has all my favorite lines i'm an oh, exceptional thief yeah he really finds the music in whatever role he's playing. And I'm kind of not surprised because it is a left turn. And what do great actors do? They mm -hmm. keep making left turns, just like a great musician. They don't want to put out the same album time after time. Like Neil Young, I don't have a choice. I'm an artist. This is where I am now. This is what I'm giving you. You know, I don't care if you don't want me in the shocking pinks with everybody's rocking. I don't care if you sue me because I didn't put out what you think my music is. I think Alan Rickman is that kind of actor. He's like, oh, this will be tough. It'll be tough to be good in this. Mm -hmm. you know. Or, or maybe he read the script and he, he saw, like great actors do, what we see on the screen. He can imagine mm -hmm. it. It doesn't seem far-fetched to me. It seems um, not obvious, but it, it makes such good sense to me that an actor would say, yeah, put me in a place I'm not used to. I really enjoy doing what I do. So please put me in a place I'm not used to. I would love to crawl out of that hole and make it work. Mm -hmm. Or even let's not praise him so much. Let's be like, that looks like I, fun. I have that six months free. Yeah, I have that six months free. Or, oh my God, that's a lot of money for a little comedy. <laughs> yeah, just that. What, what, skip just that. that. Like, yeah. no matter what got him in there, he never shortchanges his fellow actors or the audience. He's like, all right, put put the cabbage on my head. I'm going to, I'm going to show you something. I have a I, short sentence that I use whenever I'm thinking about a situation like that. And that sentence is ladies and gentlemen, salt and pepper. Peppa. That <laughs> is, that is Jean-Luc Picard. Uh, Patrick, mm -hmm. what's his name? Patrick Stewart introducing salt and pepper when he well, hosted I, SNL. Yeah. And I remember watching it again and again and again and saying, Patrick Stewart, man, he there is no role too small to take seriously. Yeah. That's what it is. There is no role <laughs> that can be approached lightly. Totally yeah. makes sense that Rickman has the exact same frame of mind. Yeah. Patrick Stewart and Salt and Pepper 
exist in a different world, just like Alan Rickman and this mm -hmm. kind of film, you would think, exist in different worlds. By the way, sidebar, it's funny you say that because just yesterday I was scrolling on Instagram and saw like a nine-year-old Fred Savage from the Wonder Years introducing Technotronic. <laughs> and it was just... That's amazing. Yeah. Pumping up the jam, Wonder Years style. And now um, the all-time favorite is, I forget who the actor is. Ladies and gentlemen, The Weeknd. Oh, uh, he doesn't say Weeknd. He says, ladies and gentlemen, The <laughs> Weeknd. But people use it on Fridays. Oh, people, that's People post perfect. the GIF on Fridays. <laughs> that's really good. Yeah. Yeah. I love Isn't it. Isn't that great? Yeah. Sidebar <laughs> ends. We are talking about Sam Rockwell. He first makes an appearance at the convention because he's introducing the clip that they're playing before the crew comes on. And then he's vamping for a long time while they're waiting for the always late Jason Nesmith to arrive. He's really great because he gets the crowd amped up. He's playing stuff and he starts just talking. This time around when I was watching, I was just listening to what he was saying. And he was just kind of narrating. They weren't just a crew. These were friends. And then they cut to backstage and <laughs> right. they're trying to grab yeah. Rickman because he's running out. And he's like, come on, hold on, come on. Um, and this is early Rockwell. So it's really nice. Sam Rockwell. Actually, the actor's name works better for the character he's playing than Guy Fliegman. Because mm -hmm. Sam Rockwell, it sounds almost like, you know, from Boogie Nights, Chest yeah. Rockwell. He's got his zip down. He's wearing he's got a uniform. Tinted glasses. Tinted glasses. I a think he's got a pendant of some yeah. kind. Yeah. And he had played a walk-on part. In, he got killed by some kind of monster. What, what you'd call a red shirt. A red on, shirt on the classic yeah. Star Trek. He does this great thing. He walks up to them. They're signing. And one of the characters, Lieutenant Laredo, played by Daryl Mitchell, who's great. He was a child on the series. He's now yeah. like 28 or something. It's not cute anymore. And it's great mm -hmm. to see him stuck in that. And so he says to Guy, Sam Rockwell's character, hey, man, thanks for that nice introduction. And he was like, hey, you mind if I sit down and sign a few headshots? <laughs> yeah. And he does. He I was in down. an episode. In the next scene, he's sitting there signing autographs. Yep. Because this is a yes and movie. It's People wonderful. are being good to each other in this movie. It is. Yeah. That explains how later Sam Rockwell ends up, he kind of elbows his way into getting digitized up with the rest of the cast. <laughs> it's he like Tom Petty like, getting into the traveling Wilburys. <laughs> yeah, George, you want this guitar? Guess who comes with it? So <laughs> anyway, Sam Rockwell is now part of the cadre of wonderful actors who are going through their changes. And there's one set piece, Dave, in this whole film that I think deserves to be called out. Jason Nesmith battling the rock monster. So it Star is Trek. So Star Trek. And it, uh -huh. it directly parallels Kirk battling the Gorn in the episode the Arena. There are a couple of guy things I love about this. There are these little like harpy-like characters that are aliens on the rock planet. And they seem really sweet from a distance. Gwen is kind of like, hi. And Rockwell grabs her. Guy is like, did you even watch the show? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, it's so good. He knows better than her. Later, when those things like kill one of their own, Gwen goes, we've got to get out of here before one of those things kills Guy. <laughs> like, it's <laughs> yeah, understood that. he's right. going to die. <laughs> anyway, they get what they need. They leave nesmith behind and he's got to battle this big rock monster and directly paralleling spock is watching kirk build this contraption which turns out to be a rocket launcher guy gets on the mic and is like look around you can you fashion some sort of rudimentary lathe <laughs> and it is the best fucking line there are like three or four lines in this movie dave i'll put up against uh -huh. any movie and that's oh one my of God, them. It's so good. Yeah. The movie's great if you've never seen Star Trek. The movie's fantastic if you're a fan. It elevates it. Just, it. It's a, it elevates it. It's a whole nother level. And that uh, there's something about that rock planet that is just, it's such a perfect Star Trek environment. And when Tim Allen is fighting the smaller, what he thinks is the monster, <laughs> the, the Gorgonac or something. Yeah. Yeah. It's really just like a wild boar or something. He does several moves that are so Shatner, jumping over it and doing a roll. 
a kick and the and, and, a, and the, the the jacket block you take your oh, jacket off and great. you like block them with your I was jacket. waiting on the double axe handle which oh, was a, a Shatner axe, classic there's another great Shatner thing though that is paralleled where afterwards after he successfully defeats this thing Rickman's character says to him see you've managed to get your shirt off yeah. <laughs> Every episode where there was a fight, Shatner would end up either shirtless or a shirt or a torn. giant cut. Giant yeah. cut. Oh, yeah. so good. So good. Yeah. Yeah. And again, Rickman just, you're thinking it as the Star Trek fan audience member, and then Rickman right. says it. Right. And yeah. Rickman's character, I should say, is Alexander Dane, which is mm, such yes. a great, it's like the Hamlet, ever the actor, while Jason is fighting the rock monster. He asks Jason to try to figure out the rock monster's motivation. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> what does it want? And he's like, I don't think it wants anything. It wants to kill me. Yeah. One thing that's great is that they set up Alexander Dane, the great actor, playing Dr. Lazarus. He cannot stand to say, by Graptar's hammer. And then later in the movie, he has his most dramatic role of his life bigger than anything on screen or stage that he's done. Quellick, the alien who worshipped Dr. Lazarus through the whole film, is dying in his arms. It's a real-life moment in which he's honestly saying the line, by Graptar's hammer, by the sons of Warvan, you shall be avenged. Everything about it is perfect. There is a dying man at his feet. He's down on one knee. The dying man is looking into his eyes. Mm -hmm. It is a Shakespearean dream come true. And yeah. it's a wonderful way to come full circle based on where that character started and what he thought this material was worth and what he thought the character he played was worth. That's why you set it up the way you do to have this kind of redemption and this kind of like mic drop of a moment for him. It's wonderful. Yeah. The look on the dying alien's face. I know. He gave him a moment of bliss at death. That's more satisfying than any curtain calls Alexander Dane ever got. What do you give the man who has everything? <laughs> what do you give the man who's dying? It is the ultimate gift for this particular quote unquote man or mm -hmm. octopus. Yeah. And that actor, Patrick Breen, that's one of the best deaths on camera I can remember. Dying is hard. And it's twice as hard in a comedy. Good point. Oh, my God. You know? Yeah. Yeah. I put that up against Kevin Spacey, LA Confidential. Oh, yeah. That's, that's a, good, a death. good death. Yeah, that's a good death. We should talk about the aliens themselves, the Thermians. It's got your guy mm. who's killing it as their leader. But you also see the future Dwight Schrute. Rain Wilson. There's one thing the, uh, that strikes me odd about the Thermians, but again, there's a weird logic to it. They all are different colored uh, octopus tentacles and such. And yet, when they do the cloaking device, they all look pretty much the same, mm -hmm. slight variation. And like that kind of, even the logic behind that kind of reads true because they came up with a humanoid with like plastered mm -hmm. down hair, like almost Spock hair. They're trying to give everyone and so i i really appreciate the attention to detail spock beetles a uh, three stooges um <laughs> a mo and, and it makes you know it just reverse it i'm gonna take 100 people and make them look like octopuses they're like Oct we can't tell octopuses apart mm -hmm. um and they see humans as a sort of general right it's you know it yeah. makes sense that they would sort of make an a, amalgam Granted, it's a fairly white amalgam, but yeah, but the show is fairly white, and that's what they're basing it on. So, yeah, I wasn't going to bring that up, but um, I would have liked to have seen more diversity. When you think about the bridge of Star Trek, you saw a nice spectrum. Yeah, you know, it would not have been out of place. It would have been very in place to be more inclusive. inclusive. It might be why you have that last name, Quan. There might have been plans for that. Yeah, um, I think they're counting Alan Rickman as a person of <laughs> foreign origin. Their one in particular is a dead ringer for Mark Zuckerberg. Um, <laughs> yeah. Like, and I actually think that these Thermians are a little, they're a little bit like a tech billionaire who is like, I do not understand how actual people speak. <laughs> right. I was oh, I've never had any 
me friends. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but apparently Enrico Calantoni came up with this. He went to the audition and they said, you're, you know, you're playing an alien and you're pretending to be human. You're not actually human. He hit them with this and they were hook, line and sinker. He also decided that while the Thermians got so much right in technology and what humans look like and how their tech works and everything, more right than right. Like they actually made things that sci-fi writers had imagined. But one of the things Thermians got wrong is they thought when humans walk, the, the hand goes forward with the leg. So when your left leg goes forward, so does your left hand. When your right leg goes forward, so does your right, right hand. A la Jack Donahue in the filming of his commercial on 30 Rock. But everyone on the ship walks in that weird way. There's dozens, maybe a hundred extras on that ship, and they all walk with that hands in the wrong rhythm. Right. And, and their hands not being expressive, just kind of like stiff. Yeah. They, they, and they clap vertically instead mm -hmm. of horizontally. I think the Thermians are a stroke of genius in this movie. They're incredibly important. Their naivete makes you root for them. Well, you um, and I love a utopian ideal. You and I love a world without war, a world without this or that. That's what they're trying to have with Sarah. And so does Gene Roddenberry. Yeah. Gene Roddenberry, you know, the, the, in Star Trek, this is not, the Federation is not Earth after the apocalypse. It's Earth after they figured it out. It's peace Earth. It's <clears throat> vegan Earth. Not Dr. Mm -hmm. Lazarus. Who has to oh, eat right. slugs and crabs and spiders in a, a soup? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and he plays it so brilliantly. <laughs> More than once, someone at a Klingon table has raised a spoonful of writhing food. Every meal is a battle. Yeah, <laughs> like, not, right. if you don't eat it right, it kills you. Yeah. <laughs> he died yeah. choking on a live spider. That's the way he yeah. would have wanted to go. But Earth is vegan. Their meat is simulated. <laughs> right. It's also hippie earth. Yeah. It's, it's love, earth. everybody. Mm -hmm. That's what works for Gene Roddenberry. And that, this is that society. This is why they were so easily fooled is because they didn't have a concept of lies and deceit. It was something they had recently learned about because Saris had lied to them several times. Right. Give me this planet. I won't kill everyone. He was lying. I just think the Thermians as an idea and the portrayal of these sweet and wide-eyed and Super smiling. Sweet. They're so easy to root for. They're so easy to fall in love with. We want so badly yeah. to, for them to prevail. And Tony Shalhoub falls in love with one of them. It, he does, which is very fitting for his character. And her alter ego is played by Missy Pyle, a very pretty actor who is in lots of comedies, dodgeball. Like Primarily, she, she works at making herself look uglier than she is, but she's allowed mm. to be her beautiful self in this. She's um, kind of tall and, and awkward in, in a lot of these things. Yeah, yeah. she yeah, is. I've seen her. She's very good. This is one of those fun movies where the ending really doesn't matter, and yet the ending winds up being satisfying. You know, They go through this whole battle, this protracted battle, with Saris, they're victorious, they think they're victorious. And then there's a false ending where Saris comes back and wreaks havoc. And then through the help of Justin Long, they work out what this Omega-13, Omega what this mystery device does. What, well established throughout the film. Yeah. That it's, that it's, the, it's the cavalry. It is. It's also the MacGuffin. It's the thing mm -hmm. that Saris wants that doesn't really matter mm -hmm. to us, but it gets the wheels in motion. It's used to great effect in the ending, much like when Superman flew around the Earth and reversed its axis to <laughs> put us back in time, mm -hmm. <laughs> which I don't think the science checks out on that, Dave. Yeah, that's just a way to destroy expensive bridges. <laughs> um, so, but yeah, the ending is fun. And then we get the second ending or the third ending by that point after they go back in time. With the Omega-13, you get the third ending, which is at the convention, where they mm -hmm. crash land and come out and everyone's like, oh my God. Then you get a fourth ending, which is the reboot of Galaxy Quest as a new show. And this time, Tony Shalhoub, Fred Kwan's girlfriend, mm -hmm. Missy Pyle is playing Leilari. Leilari. And what's cool is that they give her 
like everyone else has the actor name as, and then the fake name. She has the fake name. They had to give her a human name playing mm. Leilari, which is her actual name. So that's yeah. kind of cute. And we get the victory of Sam Rockwell as Guy Fliegman playing security chief Rock Ingersoll. <laughs> <laughs> so I good. love that. And he comes on just as cocky as ever and looking like his headshot that he's had already. Ingersoll is good too. I had a friend growing up, Ingersoll. I always love it. It's a hard name because of Ingersoll Rand. Yeah. Like, and it, yeah. it balances out well with rock, with yeah, ROC, no K. And you know, you can elevate this this rebooting of the series even more. That's a victory for all the asses in the seats at the at the convention. Mm -hmm. that's all any of these fans want is a reboot it's the holy grail i mean yeah. and they got a new show it's like no that's the biggest deal also they're gonna play this fucking show like it's shakespeare because mm -hmm. they know they're not just performing for earth mm -hmm. and they know their importance they know that what they do is important Ooh. someone built their entire society on the principles of they their characters and what they do and how they live that's good stuff see that's now great. that is galaxy quest 2 stuff right there you know ah uh, r.i.p rickman like oh my god you, for so many why, reasons that's why you don't make galaxy quest 2 yeah that's why you just don't unless you go full hologram <laughs> <laughs> oh uh, god alan rickman like, oh for fuck's sake yeah right <laughs> by grafton's <laughs> hammer don't make me a hologram <laughs> yeah i just i want to mention um the bad guys saris's henchmen in this movie carry guns that mm. i just happen to notice are very similar to jean baptiste zorg's uh zf1 pod gun from fifth element i always ah. like to draw a parallel to another sci-fi nice but check out the guns that the, the the baddies are carrying uh very yeah, they're very to, thick and plush yeah they're just, and it's almost like a shell bottom a shell top and a shell bottom and it looks mm -hmm. like they can compact together into a little pod which yeah. i think is where the pod gun comes from but yeah very similar to the fifth element guns you know what we just did alien let's talk a little bit about sigourney weaver before we wrap up i love her she's gorgeous in this but she's also strong and confident and you know as the only woman on the show she's got to do a lot of heavy lifting you know you saw at the convention how many women were dressed like her they find her inspiring i love 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 that her one job on the show was to repeat back what the computer said Mm -hmm. like even yeah. uhura even lieutenant uhura on star trek we didn't hear what the computer the computer was just yeah. beeping and she was giving what the computer said you know yeah. or she was saying big what thing someone hanging out of her ear with that yeah. big thing and she was saying that someone else was trying to hail us and she was saying what the foreign language coming in over the comm was saying in her she would interpret so Gwen DeMarco does even less she's just mm -hmm. an yeah. echo for the computer and it's yeah. it's wonderful that we see her frustration with that and she knows that she can do more and can be of more use and coming on the heels of alien where she was the lone voice of reason and the strong this is character. the anti-ripley yeah this is the anti-ripley for sure yeah yeah how much of this was pure fun for her coming off of by now she probably did alien three by then like i i, I saw an interview with her where, where she said i had so much fun it was absolute escapism. She said, it took a maximum effort to not leave the set with my blonde wig and fake boobs. <laughs> she's, like, I, I, and I, she's like, I was so into it. I just, I loved playing Gwen DeMarco. That's that so makes fun. me so happy. Yeah. Me too. Because she's, you know, she's beautiful in everything, but never required to play a character that is pure eye candy so that must have been like we said of rickman a nice left turn for her mm -hmm. yeah um yeah is there a tagline in this movie oh my goodness oh come on all i see is never give up never surrender that can't be it um let me look at i do posters. a weird thing when i hear never give up never surrender i go george benson Corey hart <laughs> yeah george Corey benson, hart you, is where i go yeah i know cory hart's obvious but george benson's never give up on a good thing check it yeah. out folks it's a great song uh, i love george benson yeah talk about your underrated here's one. Oh, they tried giving us never give up never surrender but what i found that i think works 
you know, okay, a comedy of galactic proportions. That's okay. Uh, Just okay. Yeah. There's nothing yeah. exciting about it. This movie oh. is famously poorly promoted and not, oh. I don't mean poorly as in not much. I mean, misplaced and poorly portrayed. It was treated as like a goofy, a goofball comedy. They didn't know what they had on their hands. They didn't know what they had and they promoted it incorrectly. Yes. Which happens to a lot of movies we love, sure. Dave. And they get marginalized yeah. and they fall through the cracks and then people rediscover them on streaming or, you know, comedy of galactic proportions. That's it sounds more like a Mel Brooks. It's so general. Yeah, um, it sounds like yeah. something for space balls. Yeah. I wonder, can we come up with something like uh it needs to poke at the it needs to poke at Sir Alexander Dane hating yeah. himself. It needs to yeah. it needs to scratch that itch. Um, yeah, it should be something that speaks to like the show you love, the show they hate. Mm. Something that speaks to the the dichotomy of their existence or something, yeah. you know. You're halfway there with that. Folks, write in. Yeah, let us know. Put it in the comments. <laughs> write in ballot. <laughs> oh. Um, good work, Dave. Thank you, Hollis. You too. But grab those hammer. What a savings. What a savings. <laughs> oh. Hollis and Dave would like to thank you for enjoying Pop Culture Graveyard.